so when I found out we were coming to Amsterdam uh, for a conference in Amsterdam and, and, you know, just my, what I've been doing recently is I've been reading a lot about uh, the Enlightenment, about European history, about, uh, you know, the, 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 the rise of Christianity, the dominance of Christianity, and then kind of what happened during the Enlightenment in spite of Christianity. Uh, it, it came to me that, you know, this is one of the most important cities in Western history. This is the city in which, in many respects, the Enlightenment is born. This is a city that reflects many of the, vi of the values that the Enlightenment manifests. Uh, and I thought, yeah, we should do something about Amsterdam. We should talk about Amsterdam. You, you guys are here. You're walking the streets. Uh, there's real meaning to what you're seeing out there, particularly if you have a chance to visit the museums and get a little bit of sense uh, of uh, the city itself. So I started reading up a bunch of stuff on uh, Amsterdam. And of course, as I started reading, I discovered how much I didn't know and how, how rich the history really is, much more than I expected. Um, so I'm going to give the caveat. I am not a historian. I'm not an expert on Amsterdam. Uh, you know, I'm going to give you a little flavor of a few things that I think are really important and interesting and fascinating and how they relate to some of the themes that we've had during the conference, including what you just heard from, uh, from Nico. So though, uh, I think, uh, I think uh, Amsterdam is a more positive uh, than, than what we just heard, right? Um, so this is not the definitive this is not, uh, you know, the complete history, hopefully. If you find this interesting and, you know, you'll go and do some more reading and, and discovering uh, on your own. But as you walk around in Amsterdam, and particularly if you go uh, to the museums, and particularly if you go to the art museums, what you discover is that there was a period in the city's history where this city was by far the richest city in the world. Uh, during the Renaissance, we think in terms of Italy, we think Florence, we think Rome, we think about the great art that was being produced uh, during the Renaissance, we think about some of the scientific progress, the economic progress that was happening. Primarily, we think Renaissance, we think Italy. But the reality is that for most people, life in Italy was really difficult that Italy barely economically, from a quality of life and standard of living, barely escaped the Middle Ages. From 1500 to 1700, estimates of GDP per capita, quality of life, standard of living, from a material perspective, in Italy, the richest country in 1500, at least in Europe, probably the world, was flat. I mean, it's hard to imagine today when we, we get really disappointed if the economy is not growing even a little bit, for 200 years, the economy of Italy was basically flat. What is fascinating is during those 200 years, here in the Netherlands, GDP per capita doubled, making Holland by far the richest country in the world on a per capita in terms of in terms of the wealth that individuals experience in terms of the quality of life in terms of the standard of living this was during the 17th century the richest place on the planet and it's interesting to think how that happened why it happened and then kind of what were the consequences of that wealth and the consequences of the wealth we'll start maybe there is you go to the museum and you see the fantastic art that was created here the, the, the beautiful paintings and innovative paintings and what's unique and different than the Italian paintings. What's the number one thing you notice when you go and see Dutch paintings versus Italian Renaissance? Very few Jesuses. Jesuses? Is that a term? Jesai. Uh, <laughs> the themes have changed. Whereas the Italian Renaissance is primarily Christian themes, at least what's being portrayed. I don't think the actual uh, uh, you know, theme of the painting is, is a religious theme, but the, the stories being told are religious stories. 
it, there's a certain evolution after that. You get uh, you get some uh, you get uh, Old Testament stories, which are less Christian and less orthodox and less kind of within the boundaries of what is permitted by the church. And then, of course, you get Greek mythology. And but once you come to Holland, what do you start? What do you see in in the paintings? You see couples. You see rich merchants. You see rich merchants. You see, if you go to the the museum, the, I, I can't pronounce it. What is it? The Reichs. Reichs Museum, something like that. Anyway, um, if you go to the Reichs Museum, and, and, and you should, right? Everybody should. You really should. Not just for the aesthetic experience, the historical experience, just the, the getting the sense of what this was like. You should read. When you watch, see the paintings, read a little bit because there's so much history there. There's so much embedded in these, uh, in these great paintings. But if you see Rembrandt's Night's Watchman, right? Uh, Rembrandt's Night's Watchman is this massive painting in a, in a massive room at the museum. And it's a group painting. There's a, there's a lot of people in this painting, right? And, but it's a revolutionary painting. It's very different than paintings that have been done before. And what is it that makes it dramatically different? You have a group. Usually group paintings before this, everybody's static. Everybody's expressionless. Here you have, for the first time, a massive group paintings of people in action. And every face, as you look through them, is an individual face with individual characteristics expressing their emotions, their presence at that, in this place. It might not, it's as a painting, as an aesthetic experience, it might not resonate with you. You might not feel strong emotions like, I don't know, I feel when I see Michelangelo's David and maybe some of you do. But in terms of a cultural experience, in terms of understanding the culture of the period, it is incredibly meaningful and incredibly important. In many respects, what you're seeing in the painting is the beginning of a sense that started in the Italian Renaissance and is maturing in the Dutch Enlightenment of individualism, of individual emotions being expressed, of individual character, and of wealth. One of the things the Dutch paintings celebrate is the wealth that people have, not only in the way they're dressed and in the backgrounds that are present in, you know, in those group paintings, how they all, you know, attired, but also in the still lives. If you, if you go and look at the rooms of still lives, and I know, again, for, for many people, uh, still lives, that's kind of boring. But actually go and experience them. Give yourself a chance to actually stand in front of some of these paintings and experiencing them. And first what you see is just the wealth that is presented before you. The abundance that is presented before you. And if you know anything about, human, in, if you know anything about European history, this abundance is new. And it's not the abundance of kings. Indeed, during this great period, during this uh, period in, in Dutch history, the Netherlands is a republic. It's not the wealth of aristocrats. This is the wealth of merchants. This is the wealth of the middle class. In a sense, this is the first real middle class wealth that we see in Europe. And really, the world is right here where we are sitting in the Netherlands. As you walk along... The canals, you know, we, we just take the canals for granted. But somebody built those canals. Somebody built those canals when there was very little technology to build canals. Most of the land around us is land that is being created artificially. This is all the bay. This is all water that is being filled in. If you look at the Netherlands more broadly, if you drive around the Netherlands, those of you who live here know this, right? This whole country is a massive feat of engineering. 
This is a country that is below, for I think a third of it, or two thirds of it, something between there, is below sea level. It used to flood regularly. And they built dikes. They built canals. It is the convergence of five major rivers, European rivers, all come in here. So it's a delta. And if you've been anywhere in the world where there are deltas, it's swampy, it's almost impossible to live in this kind of environment. And yet the Dutch took this area and they made something of it. Human ingenuity, human engineering, building dikes, building canals. Canals, by the way, are the cheapest way of moving goods from point to point it is on barges, on boats. So if you can imagine Europe sending all its goods, Central Europe, Germany sending all its goods along the rivers, all converging right here, and then a series of canals taking those to the ports, onto ships, and shipping them to the rest of the world. This becomes a major trading hub. But it's that building of the canals, the building of the dikes, that really establishes, creates, out of nothing, out of nature, out of this space that we all today inhabit. And all this beauty is artificial beauty. All those canals, artificial canals. There's no, nature doesn't create these nice round, you know, nice shaped uh, places in which you can, uh, you can move around. So this is a city which is an engineering feat. And that engineering feat actually happens before its golden age. So this is kind of the setup for, uh, for uh, the Netherlands. It also is a source of, uh, of migration. Lots of people come here to work in the building of the canals and the buildings of the, uh, of the dikes uh, from Central Europe. Uh, people are coming into the Netherlands and the, the population is growing because initially there's not a lot of people here because it's not particularly livable. So a lot of activity is going on. This is, you know, 15th century, 1400s, 1500s, early 1500s. Uh, the building the dikes, the reclaiming land. And at the same time, there's a growing intellectual world that, that, that starts happening here in, the, in, 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 uh, in Holland. Uh, uh, not Holland, in the Netherlands, because, uh, you know, Holland is just one part of the Netherlands. And, you know, I don't know why, and I, I haven't found a particular explanation. I don't know if there is an explanation. But this became the hub of humanism, the hub of, a, of the integration or the attempt to integrate Greek ideas, Greek philosophy, Greek individualism into the ideas of Christianity. And when you read the first kind of uh, Dutch uh, humanists, Christian humanists, you can see them struggling with the ideas of Christianity and the ideas of individualism, individuality, uh, the relationship of the individual to God. Even before the Protestant Reformation, they are already struggling with breaking away from the Catholic Church, breaking away from the dogma, breaking away from authoritarianism, and placing the core of ideas, of beliefs, at the level of the individual rather than at the level of a loyalty to some pope and some church far away in Rome. And of course, this makes it very much fertile ground for the Reformation. So once the Reformation happens, it, it, is, it is here that, that it, it just really catches fire. I mean, Holland, uh, again, Netherlands is one of the places that becomes, uh, that becomes Protestant very, very quickly. Uh, and uh, this Protestantism, well, you know, we can debate, and, and there are debates about, uh, uh, you know, <laughs> which religion, Protestant to Catholic, which one is more, I don't know, more what, more rational? Uh, when you talk about irrational philosophies, which one is more rational is an interesting conversation. But one thing is, is clear. That the Protestant break away from dogma. They break away from uh, a, a blind following for one set of beliefs established by an authoritarian church. And there's a reason why Protestantism breaks apart into a thousand different sects. It's because it allows now for the freedom to interpret these ideas in a much more individualistic way. 
And that, that happens right here. A lot of that is happening right here. One of the great thinkers of that period, Erath Erasmus, Erasmus, right? I'll, I'll learn Dutch slowly. Um, is is again right here in in Athens, consider in Athens in uh, the Netherlands, considered one of the uh, great thinkers of uh, the uh, very early Reformation. Um, a a uh, again a challenger to Luther. He's not he's not buying into the particular. Uh, story that Luther's telling. He's got his own interpretation of this, but clearly breaking away from the Catholic Church, the authoritarianism, the dogma, and and you know uh, placing much more of the uh, uh, you know of the import of the uh, how you choose your beliefs and how you choose your ideas in the in the la in the minds of individuals, in the belief sets of individuals. The lights just went off somewhere here. Uh, and you see a, a, a slow progression of increased intellectual activity here. I try to pronounce the other guy's name, Grotius, uh, but I can't. So uh, uh, another thinker who's crucial is also right here, uh, crucial to the development of the concept of individual rights. Locke is inspired by him. Um, also somebody who develops a, a significant theory on uh, just war theory. Some of you know that I've written about this. Um, and... Uh, and a, and a figure, an again, an important figure within this Reformation, another split within the Reformation. And what happens because of all this more focus on individual interpretation rather than on dogma is that the Netherlands become very tolerant. Uh, they, they emphasize religious tolerance. There's actually a declaration of religious tolerance in the Netherlands in the late 16th century, which allows for different sects to come here and different peoples to inhabit here. And again, what you get is significant migration in. One of the, one of the significant migrations is a migration of Jews. Jews who are persecuted in Spain, who are kicked out of Spain uh, during the Inquisition, go to Portugal, and then Portugal adopts the Inquisition, so they all have to leave Portugal, and many of them come to Amsterdam, bringing their wealth and their knowledge and their, uh, uh, you know, their, their contacts in the Iberian Peninsula. Remember, this is a period in which Spain and Portugal are dominant powers in the world, and they bring their contacts from Iberia and Spain, and they settle here in Amsterdam, and they are welcome. And it's the one place in Europe where there's very little anti-Semitism. And of course, one of these Jews who comes from, Port, uh, from Portugal is a young man who is clearly a genius, is identified within the Jewish community as a genius. But there's a challenge with geniuses, particularly geniuses who are thinkers, who, who, who are, you know, use your mind to question. And the challenge with him is he questions, and he questions, and he questions, to the point where the rabbis say, enough. Too many questions. You're challenging our dogmas. And they ultimately kick him out. They excommunicate him from the religion uh, out of Judaism. His name is Baruch Spinoza. You might know him as the great, Spin the great philosopher Spinoza. And, but he finds within the community of intellectuals here in Amsterdam, he finds a home in, in, in the Netherlands. And he creates a community of students around him. And he has incredible influence on the thinkers and the students around. Now, again, I'm no expert on Spinoza, but many writers on the Enlightenment consider him kind of the original radical Enlightenment thinker, somebody who kind of sets a tone against somebody who influences people like Locke and many of the French Enlightenment thinkers. Spinoza is a crucial force behind the establishment of an Enlightenment intellectual world. The fact that there is tolerance in the Netherlands also makes it possible for, Netherlands, for publishers in the Netherlands, book publishers in the Netherlands, to start publishing books that other countries will not publish. So Spinoza's books, which he publishes, by the way, without signing them, without his name, anonymously, because they are so controversial in the world, because he's challenging a Christian or a Jewish God. 
He's challenging much of the dogma that exists uh, in the world. They're published here. Uh, the Netherlands becomes the center of, of uh, publishing uh, intellectual books in the world. Uh, the, by some estimates, some between 50% and two-thirds of all the books published in Europe are published here in the Netherlands. Anybody controversial is publishing here. They're willing to publish him here. Uh, so, uh, it, you know, uh, uh, when Law has to leave England because he's worried because there's a Catholic king, he comes here. Uh, when Voltaire wants to publish his books in the 18th century, they're published in Amsterdam. Uh, so thinker after thinker after thinker who are controversial and who face censorship in their local communities, in their local countries, are publishing in Amsterdam. And then there's an entire network during the Enlightenment. I mean, the Enlightenment's a fascinating period. But there are entire networks of book smuggling, if you will, because these books are banned in different countries, and yet they reach all over Europe. So everybody is reading, all, all the intellectuals are reading these books in spite of the fact that they are being censored and banned. But Amsterdam is the hub of that. Amsterdam is the middle of that. The publishing industry here until the end of the 18th century is the dominant publishing industry in the world. So these are just some of what you get if you, if you, if you think about finance, the world of finance. Uh, the first stock market in the world is right here in Amsterdam. The first publicly listed corporation is here in Amsterdam, the East India Company, which is responsible for Dutch colonialism, particularly in Indonesia and the Far East. Um, one, of the, one of the reasons, just to round out, one of the reasons the museum here, the, the Museum of Amsterdam has, uh, it used to be, uh, there used to be a whole segment of the museum about the golden age of the Netherlands. Right? This is the age of Rembrandt and Vermeer. This is the age of the great painting and the wealth and, uh, and, and everything we've described and the intellectuals of Spinoza. Well, now it's no longer called the Golden Age. Golden Age has been removed. Why? Anybody know why the, they, they no longer call it the Golden Age? It's not politically correct. It's not politically correct, but why? Well, because of colonialism and one real sin that the, that, that, that the Dutch committed, uh, a true sin, not a, not a politically correct sin, but one, one real sin, what, what, what would they trade? What would the, yes, the, so, so the, 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 largest, um, the largest slave merchants during the, uh, during the 17th century were the Dutch. So uh, they had the, the slave routes, they, they, so... No, it was actually, I mean, it was actually the Dutch for a while. They were later replaced by the British, by the English. Uh, but for a while, it was the Dutch who had the largest... Uh, yeah, but not just the Dutch, uh, now it's Holland. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> now you blame Holland, okay. <laughs> now it's just Holland. Uh, one other point I want to make, um, you can make a lot of points, but one other point is, during this period, one of the amazing things when I was reading about this is during this period when, when uh, Netherlands became as rich as it became, it was actually a period of war. Um, the Netherlands fought an 80-year war, 80, 80-year war against the Spanish for independence. And uh, it lasted, technically it lasted 80 years. It only ended in 1648 with the signing of the Westphalian um, um, Peace Treaty, which also ended the Thirty-Year War. Thirty-Year uh, War, for those of you who don't know, probably the most brutal war in all of European history on a per capita, casualty per capita basis. Uh, the Germans managed to kill a third of their own population in the name of what? Anybody know what the war was fought in name of? Religion. Religion. So this was the war between Catholics and Protestants. And within Germany, a third of the population was, was, was slaughtered. Uh, over during the 30-year war. But at the same time as the 30-year war was going on, here in the Netherlands, they're fighting an 80-year war against the Spanish to achieve their independence. And while they're fighting that war, they're also becoming the richest country in the world, in spite of the war. You know, the, the Marxists might say because of the war, but it is in spite of the war. Right? So this is an incredibly rich place, an incredibly interesting place. Um, a place where immigration played a huge positive role. 
Uh, one of the things that happened is Spain took over the South Netherlands, which today is called Belgium, right? And uh, all the Protestants, the, the Spanish required the Protestants to leave. They had four years to pack up their stuff and leave. And where did they all come? They left Antwerpen, which was one of the wealthiest, most successful trading ports, and they all came here again to Amsterdam and its regions and, uh, and the Netherlands. So it's a place of uh, in immigration, it's a place of wealth, and it's a place of intellectual activity, and that's not an accident. It's intellectuals that set up, set this up. These humanists were setting this place up as a place that had a positive attitude towards the individual, a place, really, maybe the first place in Europe to start celebrating wealth, celebrating achievement, having a positive attitude towards wealth. Because think about the Christian attitude towards wealth. Even in Italy, there was a huge amount of criticism ongoing within Christianity and within Catholicism, attacking wealth creation. Here, at least for that period, there was real celebration of that wealth. Uh, the Netherlands ultimately starts declining for a variety of different political reasons. It gets attacked by the French, and ultimately that happens uh, after the Netherlands conquers Eng England, right? Are there any British here? Right? Yeah. I mean, it's the Netherlands that conquers you guys. Um, William of Orange arounds, arrives in England and, uh, and basically becomes king and starts a line. And the center of gravity, interestingly enough, of economic activity, intellectual activity, trade, and military might shifts from the Netherlands to, uh, to the United Kingdom. And the Netherlands starts declining as the United Kingdom uh, starts rising uh, significantly in every one of those dimensions. And even if you look at the art, the art starts declining. Uh, and by the 19th century, clearly the center of gravity has shifted uh, aesthetically to places like France uh, and away from the Netherlands. But this is a, it's an example of this city rising, being incredibly successful, and then kind of peaking and, and tapering off but a, an example of vibrant intellectual activity, aesthetic activity to follow up on Nikos. Uh, you want intellectual, vibrant intellectuality, vibrant aesthetics, and a vibrant economy. The foundations, the, the, the uh, ideas and the foundations that later become kind of British uh, and American capitalism, the ideas of individual rights, the ideas of secularism in Spinoza and others, those foundations are laid right here in the city. So enjoy it as you walk around, appreciate it. It is a testament to the human mind. It is a testament to human engineering. It's a testament to human success and prosperity. Thank you. All right, I know there were, so the questions, uh, any questions on this, but also I know people had questions from yesterday that they didn't get to ask. There was a long line of questions and people didn't get to ask, so feel free to ask about anything you want, including what we covered yesterday or anything else. Is this working? Yeah? Okay. Um, it relates to what you talked about now as well, but uh, does the capacity to automate r romantic art and other aesthetic forms through AI programs like Midjourney, which can incorporate centuries in, of artistic knowledge in minutes, diminish its value in Rand's view of objective aesthetics? Will art ultimately favor content over technical skill? Um, I don't know. <laughs> I mean, I think it's fascinating. I think we're in for a period where art is going to have to, artists are going to have to figure this out and figure out um, what these tools are capable of, where does their artistic expression come in, how do they use these tools better to enhance their own art, um, what is just copying and dull and uninteresting and what is a true aesthetic experience it, 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 it is it is 
it's going to be complicated and it's going to be super interesting. And, and if you're an artist today, and I think if you're anything today, you've got any profession, you've got to start thinking about how is this new technology going to affect me? How is this new technology, how can I make it a tool to make myself better? The last thing you want is to be afraid of it. The last thing you want is to resent it. The last thing you want is to try to protect yourself from it because it, it, it's, it, you know, this is an amazing technology. It, it can contribute enormously to human progress and human success. I'm sure that in the hands of the right artists, it can enhance our aesthetic experiences, but you're going to have the right art, you're going to have to find the right, right artists. And, and one of the, one of the really sad things about the world in which we live is how few great art artists there are today. I, I, I can't think of very many areas in which there are good art. Maybe in the, maybe in the movies, TV stuff, there's, there's some good artists, but you know, I, I don't consider much of the music today particularly artistic. There's almost no painting and sculpture that's worth anything. Um, the playwriters, novelists, you know, there's, there's some, but nothing great, nothing that is really outstanding. So first we have to get the great artists, and then they have to figure out how to work with AI. The problem is going to be that we're going to be flooded by mediocre, superficial, stupid stuff. Okay, thank you. That, that, that's going to be what's going to dominate. Thanks. Uh, hi, so my question relates to one part of the talk. So do you think that which one of the denomination of Christianity is better, Protestantism or Catholicism? <laughs> Do you want to die of cancer or heart attack? <laughs> um, it better for what? And better for whom? So, uh, you know, it, it, Catholicism has, quote, the advantage uh, uh, of being, of, of, uh, of appealing for the most, uh, of appealing in a certain segment of it, in a certain part of it, to kind of this idea of reason and intellectuality and figuring stuff out uh, in, in real detail. Protestantism particularly as it manifested itself later in, in evangelical, uh, is very emotional. It's a very about being, being emotional, expressing emotion, and, and put reason aside, right? But which Protestants, right, it, it, all of them are different. I, you know, I hesitate to say this because I'm not an historian and, and somebody's going to have to really do the work, by the way, Maybe some of you will do this work. I think it's fascinating because the more I read about this, the more interesting I get into it. But the advantage of pro Protestantism or whatever, right, of the Reformation is that, again, it breaks the dogma. But, but there's also this weird situation where Calvin and, and Luther, Calvin and Luther are really, really, really horrible people. I mean, it's hard to... Overst overstate how horrible they are and how, how, how the, what they think about us as human beings. I mean, they think we're fallen, we're, we're despicable. Uh, they also think you're predestined to either go to heaven or hell. So before you're born, you're predetermined about whether you go to heaven or hell. And there's a sense in which people took that to mean, well, it doesn't really matter what I do while I'm alive. I'm already determined whether I go to heaven or hell. So if the Catholics really, towards the end of their life, really focused on doing altruistic stuff and giving their money away so they could buy themselves into heaven, Calvin and Luther says, forget it. You, you, it's already determined. So you can try all you want. If you're going to hell, you're going to hell. And one of the things that happened is that a charitable giving towards the end of one's life dropped significantly. In, in the Protestant world, and there was much more of accumulation of capital within families. There was much more inheritance passed along to children, and there was much more accumulation of capital in the Protestant world than it was in the Catholic world because, you know, because of this idea of predestination. Then the other thing that happened was, you know, usury is being considered a sin by, by the Catholic Church. And the Catholic Church, and usury is not excess interest, usually was perceived as any interest. So uh, there was real difficulty in doing banking in, in the Catholic world. Luther's, Luther's view was, he says, look, this world sucks. This is an awful, sinful, horrible world. You want to do usury? Go ahead. It doesn't matter. He literally says, he says, in the kingdom of heaven, there's no usury. 
the ideal, there's no usury, but this world, it's grubby anyway. So go for it. So banking develops here in a way that it cannot in the South. And one of the reasons I think that the North becomes richer than Italy, which starts off much richer because it has the heritage of Rome, is because people are, quote, allowed to, to engage in economic activity because, you know, who cares? What really matters is the next world, so I enjoy this one, right? I I if you can, and you're predestined anyway. And they don't take, I mean, obviously, you can't be motivated that way. That is, the individuals are not motivated that way. But at least it takes a certain burden off them, and it takes a certain level of authoritarianism off of them. So, um, it, so in that sense, in terms of the economic development, I think the Protestant world is better. I don't think it's about the Protestant work ethic. I think it's about this idea of go for it, right? And there's no authoritarian dogma, this is what you have to do. I, uh, all the time, there's much more of leaving it up to you as an individual to decide the nature of your faith rather than uh, you know, a particular formula that the Catholic Church sticks to. Thank you. But they're both horrible. Just so <laughs> I'm very anti-Christian. I have a I think difficult... Ankar said that yesterday, and we compete on who's more anti-Christian, the two of us. So. Then uh, I'm sure you'd love this question. Yeah. Um, this is a difficult, somewhat heretical one with when you look at religions, there's only non-objective and objective thinking, right? And the subjective thinking, whether it's religion, Marxism, whatever, it's all wishy-washy, non-objective. And looking at religions this way, <laughs> I'm interested to hear your opinion. Seeing that the Thirty Years' War is not very different from the religious conflicts of Ireland and today in Israel Hamas, they're not throwing theological arguments. Sweden got involved in the Thirty Years' War to protect Protestant lives, and yep. they certainly didn't do it because they wanted to get their point across uh, to the Christian, to the Catholic Church. So, to draw in another uh, string of reference you put in yesterday, which was you'd like the country, the world, to be as few countries as possible, these big blocks. Yeah. I would love to hear your stance on this. Then, when you see that, if you look at Christianity. Compared to Islam, how much of a, how how often Christianity splits off from itself, and how much Islam doesn't? When you look at certainly the objective thinkers of the world are not in majority, yet hopefully, hopefully, it seems to me that all the free states of the world are ones that l that manage to play the big states off of each other. It seems to me that the religion that reformed itself, that the peasants were allowed to read the Bible themselves because you were supposed to think for yourself now and make your own opinion of this. It seems that the only reason America s survived, the greatest political document, the founding fathers, that even though they were deists, yeah. Iran revered yeah. as the best that we had until now. Yeah. And that's the way I see it too. So I would like to see your point of, aren't you, it, with this perspective of these objectivist, as close to objectivist thinkers as possible, it being a 2,000 year journey in that sense of humanity actually learning to think for itself and playing the big non-objective powers against each other. Because if France and England formed that personal union, yeah. America never would have been. And we would have 200,000 years more maybe. Of so I don't view it as, as uh, you know, the size of country or anything like that as being relevant. Look, um, but there's a, there's a hint there of it's Christianity that gave us the modern world. And the answer to that is no, no, no. It's in spite of Christianity we got all the benefits. It's in spite of them. That is, I'm, I'm reading now two really, really good books that I think Ben Baer at the Institute recommended and are, and are fascinating. The first one, it's, a, it's a, the same author. The first one's called The Closing of the Western Mind. And it basically starts with Greece. And the flourishing of Greece and the success of Greece and how wonderful Greece is and how wonderful Rome is to a large extent. And then Christianity comes around and shuts it down. Literally shuts it down. Shuts the mind down. And for a thousand years, there are no astronomical observations in the West. After Greece, every generation they're observing. They, they don't get it right, but they're observing and they're adding to our body of knowledge. For a thousand years, there's zero. For a thousand years, there are no new discoveries in Christianity about medicine. Nothing. Nothing. Until Harvey. 
It's over a thousand years, almost 1,500 years from, I forget the name of the uh, Roman um, physician. Uh, but anyway, the, 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 the Western mind is shut completely. And then the second book is the reopening of the Western mind. And the reopening of the Western mind is not by Christianity. It's by people within the Christian world, because the whole world in this part of the world is Christian, starting to discover Greece. It's Aristotle and even Plato and the, all the Greek philosophers who open up the Western world in spite of Christianity and in spite of Christianity's attempt to close it. If you look at all the, 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 the thinkers who are introducing Greek ideas into the world, the Christianity would like to suppress them or would like to stop them. So it's ideas that shape the world, not countries, not size, not shape. And indeed, if you look at Islam, First of all, Islam splintered before Christianity because Islam splintered to Shiite and Sunni well before Christianity had Protestants. And, but Islam went through a golden age and the book makes the case. Islam, to the extent that they adopted Greek ideas during a certain period in their history, they were the one making astronomical observations. They were hundreds of years ahead of the Christian world in terms of medicine. Hundreds, if you want to study medicine, you went to Persia. In the, in the 10th century, 11th century, 12th century. Uh, they, they were making, I mean, think of algebra. Think of, I mean, stunning that until the, I think it was the 12th or 13th century, in the, in, in the Christian world, we were still using Roman numerals. Can you imagine doing math with Roman numerals? And what brought, you know, the, 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 the number system we have today, the Arabs. Learned it from India and brought it into the West. So, no, it's not how many countries or the division or all of that. What it is, is ideas. It is intellectuals. It is the rediscovery of a great civilization of the past, which is Greece, that ultimately reshaped it. And once those ideas were introduced, then there was no question Christianity would splinter. There was no question that they would start challenging dogma and start thinking anew. They weren't quite ready to give up on God and give up on Christianity, but things were going to break up and there was going to be, there was going to be conflict. And the question is just what kind of conflict that was and how it would manifest itself. But it, it, it is, if you're going to give you know, the credit for the world in which we live goes to the Greeks and it goes to the Greek thinkers and the Greek philosophers and to the people in the West who discovered them and were courageous enough and brave enough to challenge the church and to advocate for these ideas in spite of the fact that many of them risked their lives in order to do it. The New Testament is in Greek. <laughs> it, was all, it was all in Greek, right? I mean, uh, early civilization was Greek. I mean, the Western Church split and became and, and turned to Latin, but the, but all of the important writings were originally in Greek, and and part of a, a lot of what a lot of that has been lost because because the Christians burned down a lot of libraries. Thank you. You may have just answered my question about the books, uh, the closing of the Western mind, reopening of the Western mind. Was it uh, something else that you would uh, recommend uh, about the Enlightenment? You said uh, you read recently something uh, <laughs> apart, apart from these two. Well, I mean, a, a favorite author of mine about the Enlightenment is a guy named Jonathan Israel. He write, he's written a lot of books. Now, he's quite academic. Some of them are quite academic. And, it, you know, so when I was, wanted to re read about um, the history of the Netherlands, Uh, I, you know, I, I knew Jonathan Israel was interested, so I, I found a book of his on uh, the history of the Netherlands, not available in um, in audiobook, not available in Kindles. So I had to buy an actual book, which I don't do anymore, and it showed up in my house, and it was it was Atlas Shrugged is like tiny in comparison. It was this thick, and I have to admit, I haven't read the whole thing. I just, uh, you know, I it was, but it's fascinating and. He is a little academic. He can be a little academic. He has some po more popular books, but, but he's a favorite. Um, there's one, uh, The Enlightenment, The Pursuit of Happiness, uh, something about The Pursuit of Happiness, which is quite good. It's, it's got Pursuit of Happiness in the title and Enlightenment. Um, I, 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 I really like the book, The Cave in the Light, which is a history of, all the, of Western history, basically from the perspective of the battle between Aristotle and Plato. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Okay, Jaren. Uh, for those who don't, don't know me, I've lived my whole life in the Netherlands, and 
by far you address the most positive <laughs> country that I've ever heard. Uh, but I like to uh, uh, recommend, maybe you've read him already, but after the 80 years war with Spain, we had a government and that period was called True Freedom. Yep. And that was by Johan de Witt. And basically he motivated a lot of people to, for instance, Gotius or Hugo de Groot, to write about free seas. So as you go to Millet, maybe you can bring some of Johan de Witt's ideas <laughs> because he was a guy in his 30s running our country with specifically calling freedom is required. Yeah, and, and there was a republic here. And it, yeah. it, it was, it was, it, 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 this was probably the freest country at the time in Europe. Um, it, that unfortunately ended at some point, again, I think because of the war with France. But, um, but he, he, there was a period here where there was, a, there was a, a, a republic. It wasn't a republic in the same sense as America. But it was, given the times, it was about as free as you could get uh, in Europe. It was more similar to the kind of the Venetian republics and the uh, uh, Florentine republics and, and republics that have been that have been around for a while. Not, you know, kind of the the, the, the American system of government, but as good as it got. So uh, this is, in in that sense, very much a, a, a part of the the beginning of civilization and a, or a crucial key point in civilization, a transmission of civilization from Italy to Northern Europe. Yeah. The things, and the end of his regime, basically, don't, you don't know it, but they were butchered and then we got kings back. Yeah. So that yep. the, and that's the decline. Yeah. Yep. Thanks.